you know, after the drug gets approved, it's a feather in your cap, right? You have been part of an NDA. That's great. <laughs> you know, your value goes up. But after that, what do you do? Welcome to Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast. I'm Dr. Jen Barna, and today I have a terrific guest, Dr. Neil Shankar, a leading physician in the pharmaceutical industry who has held clinical development positions within numerous pharmaceutical companies. Dr. Shankar is president and chief medical officer of Swan Bio LLC, a business development consultancy firm that facilitates the translation of scientific discoveries into cancer therapeutics. Dr. Shankar, welcome to Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast. Thanks for having me, Jen. Good morning, good afternoon, viewers, wherever you are. I'm so interested in hearing about your journey because you've had tremendous success. You've had a career where you've made such a difference in numerous therapeutics to treat various forms of cancer. And I'd love to hear when you decided to go into the pharmaceutical side and do you practice clinically as well? Or no, 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 not for the last 20 odd years. No. If you would tell me a little bit from the beginning how you decided to get into pharmaceuticals. I think a lot of our listeners are curious about that. It's not something that most of us know much about. So Absolutely, Jen. I think you nailed it. it. I stumbled upon it, even I was not aware of it. So I'm originally from southern part of India, a state province called as Kerala. That's where I'm originally from. Moved into the U.S., I think, end of 1998. I did my U.S. MLE Step 1, and I came into the U.S. to do my Step 2 and then pursue my career as a clinician. At that time, interestingly, I got an opportunity to work in National Cancer Institute, which is under the federal government Health and Human Services. And I got my medical oncology training there. I'm primarily an internist, but evolved into a medical oncology primarily due to my training and work involvement there. So interestingly, NCA was looking for foreign clinicians to support their phase one phase two programs, which are funded by their own arm, which is CTEP. And that's where I stumbled upon this. Clinical research was very new to me. I mean, I have heard about it, but it's like a story, right? It's not something. So then I went on continuing that for almost four years in National Cancer Institute. I had the privilege of working with some very big names in the lymphoma field there. And then started getting more interest pursuing that career path. And then after four years of my involvement in NCI, I moved into the industry and then kept on moving with different companies. Now I have my own startup. Swan Bio is a medical consulting firm. You know, I'm the only one there primarily doing, as you nicely pointed out, you know, translational science to getting these therapeutics approved, whether it's biologics small molecules, you name it. So that's where my role comes from. And that's what I've been doing from 2014. I've been consulting from this company, Swan Bio, been consulting with few clients. And now I'm also part of the executive management of few startups. I don't know if I can reveal that, but one of them is going IPO very soon this year. Again, touch wood, we don't know how the market is going to go, but looking forward to that journey too. So just out of curiosity, is the startup that you're involved in that's going public, is that a pharmaceutical? Yes, it is. It is absolutely. It's a therapeutic pharmaceutical company, and we have assets in primarily in oncology and inflammatory space. Okay, great. So there's a lot here that we can talk about. For starters, I would just love to know, for someone who's thinking about perhaps a career in pharmaceuticals, would you say that it is something that really should be a decision made very early in a career? It depends. That's a very good question, Jen, because, you know, a lot of the people keep trying to move back to the industry was being in the academia, for example, or a clinical care at the hospital setting or the tertiary care center, you name it. The problem, though, is I tell people, a lot of them reach out to me. I work with clinicians primarily, right? 
pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies are my clients, but then I also interact primarily with all the KOLs, uh, key opinion leaders in cancer and uh, principal investigators. These are all leading clinicians, people all the way range from people starting the academia to very senior level professor, chair, and so forth. So one thing I would like to let them know is you can do that from start. Because when I started my career, I wouldn't say there was a lot of options available in the sense, I don't remember at least seeing courses primarily. To, I mean, there are some uh, certification courses, but they were all kind of very low key. But now you have very specific courses, whether it's in biometrics, data management, and also in clinical research, clinical development. I mean, there are a lot of very tailored and much expansive courses now. So people have to kind of go through that, see what their interest is, because even in pharmaceutical, there are different avenues, right? You can be in the preclinical lab setting because there are a lot of clinicians who have their own lab, even they are working in the academia where they do research. Then they are also in patient care. Then there are a lot of clinicians who move into safety management within pharmaceuticals. And then they go into medical affairs, for example, medical affairs and commercial, which is like after the drug gets a regulatory approval, right? For example, FDA, then they go into commercial medical affairs. And that obviously involves a lot of traveling, 60 to 70% of travel. So they have to kind of figure out where they want to be in. But one thing I would always caution people, though, is it's a very stressful place to be in generally, because when you are coming from academia, yes, you deal with the patient care, but you probably know how your day goes most of the time. Whereas in the pharmaceutical industry, things could change by the hour, especially you're working in a small company. I mean, if the data doesn't look good, right, there's a safety issue with the drug, you are learning that. FTA shuts down the trial due to patient safety, you are gone. I mean, next day you don't have a work, right? So it's a very stressful place to be in. But, you know, every job has their own pros and cons. That's how I would put it. But people have to be aware of that. Yes, there is money there. You know, I think the industry pays you more than what you obviously make in an academic setting or anything. Definitely more, but it comes with its issues too. When you started out, did you go the lab route or more administrative? Oh, I didn't go. I went into the clinical development, uh, more on the clinical side. I never touched lab. So my role starts from, let me put it this way, uh, late translation, like you finish, you know, testing in the lab, you finish testing in the animals. Now you are ready to enter the clinic. That's when I kind of start my role. So from then on, I kind of take the drug all the way up to regulatory approval. And so when you were first starting and at NCI, how did you see the opportunity to go into pharmaceuticals and what was your entry point? Yeah, that's a good question. When I started working on it, I always liked science because I was always strong in biology on my school. is very strong. So I always said that science niche And I kind of liked it because I get to work with new therapeutics, right? When you are in the clinical setting, yes, you are saving patients' lives, you know, you are treating the patient. But for me, I am working on those drugs, getting it to the market. So to me, that's more enticing because I get to see work with these drugs. This particular job, I also have to be very involved. I also have to do a lot of training. It's like you are a practicing clinician. You have GCP trainings. You have a lot of SOPs. You do it. There's tons of training. I mean, because this environment is a very regulated environment. Whatever you do, you have to document it. Because if you don't document it based on the regulatory agency's thought, it's not done. If it's not jotted down, it has not happened. So it's a very, very regulated environment. So, you know, that's how I kind of moved into that. So I was very intrigued by the science. You know, that was the shift for me. You came in on the regulation side? 
No, no, no. I came on the political side, but what I meant by regulation is the whole industry is very regulated, right? It's like everything because the moment you take a drug to approval, regulatory agencies do audit, you know, whether they do a total audit of the company, they do an audit of the product. I mean, everything is kind of looked through the lens. It's a very tedious a year process, right? Once you submit the approval package, it takes almost a year for FTA to review that because there's a whole set of review process happening at that time. Yeah, and that's a great point, which brings us really to what you're doing now. I, having worked for a pharmaceutical company startup way back before I went to graduate school and medical school, I know a little bit about the process of drug discovery and what a difficult road that can be for a small startup company. And so is what you're doing assisting those companies to bring their product to the market? Exactly. That's exactly my role is. So I start from designing the clinical trial to designing the whole clinical strategy. How should we take it forward? You know, what is the therapeutic, what is the cancer type you need to go in? Should we take a combination strategy? Should we combine our drug with something else and go? Or should we go take an independent route, like just our drug? You know, so there's a lot of things involved. Those decisions would be made based on what is out there for this particular cancer. How crowded is the market? Because a smaller a company is, you don't want to be kind of a situation where you are catching up, right? You are never going to catch up with a big pharma. You don't have the financial muscle or the people, you know, capital muscle or anything, right? Headcount. It's working with few, maybe 10, 20 people, right? And then we outsource it to a CRO. So for us, it's very, very important. Clinical strategy is the most key thing. You know, how do we take it to the market at the quickest way possible, rather? Yeah. So now, what is the earliest stage that you begin working with someone? If, say, someone is in academics and they are doing research and they have an idea for a potential product, at what point would they potentially reach out to you for help in terms of creating a startup? Would it be after they've already got the startup and then they're looking to get to the next phase or would it be prior to starting That's a good question. So the time frame they would kind of reach out to me is, you know, we will be in early discussions in the sense where it's going, but the time point when they want me hands-on would be when they are ready to enter the clinic. That's how I would put it. So that means when they are ready to start their phase one early clinical trial program, first time in human testing, that's when ideally I mean, I start working earlier to that, but that would be the ideal time frame. I will start coming into the play. Perfect. Good to know. Now, I would like to shift gears and ask you a little bit about your journey. Delve in a little bit further because what you did, if I understand what you're saying, you came to the U.S., you were already a physician, and oh, yeah. you began working at NCI. and. Right. You saw this opportunity to go into the pharmaceutical industry, but you took it so much further than just that. And we'll publish in the show notes a list of all the different pharmaceutical companies where you've worked and the clinical trials, phases one, two, and three. And the body of work that you've accomplished is impressive and extensive. And I would love to know if something might come to mind for you of a time that you saw some struggles in this achievement or you know, what was the journey like? Was it just a simple, straight path to success all the way? How would you describe it? That's, again, a very good question. So not easy, at least for me, didn't come easy. So the way I did it was, I kind of timed it well, but I also used to network quite a bit during my early phase of the career. So I would like to encourage my viewers to, you know, network, professional networking, right? That's what I meant is very, very important because especially the biotech pharma industry is a small world. I mean, if you work 15 to 20 years in the industry, you pretty much know a lot of people. Let me put it that way. So 
you may have worked with them directly or indirectly, but they know you, you know them. It's like, that. yeah, I have heard about him, you know, through so-and-so, or yeah, I have worked with him. So the way I would put it is it didn't come easy for me and I kind of moved along. So within the industry, one thing you would notice is within the clinical development, you know, the clinicians within that space, I would say at least 60 to 70% of them move out of the company. Normally a journey of a drug is probably five to seven years, right? So what happens is, for example, somebody is joining a company, the middle part of the life cycle, right? And then he or she takes it to approval. You know, after the drug gets approved, it's a feather in your cap, right? You have been part of an NDA. That's great. (laughs) You know, your value goes up. But after that, what do you do? I mean, the drug is approved. There is kind of, do you want to stay here? Go see, there is, they have another drug or another team you could move into. Because that's when a lot of people do leave. You know, they probably go to a startup or they go to a different company because at the end of the day, you know, you need to keep yourself motivated, right? You can't just stay. So that's what I did. So I kind of moved out two to three years and, you know, that kind of helped me out. Then I moved into the Bay Area, maybe 11 years back, and then moved to Genentech, got a great job, a great company at that time. Even now, they're great. You know, that's when a lot of things started changing for me. I started networking more, and then I moved on to then Pharma Cyclics. That was another great company I was involved with. I was involved with the NDA there for one of the cancer in hematological malignancy. So I got two NDAs, and then I decided to start my consulting firm and moved on. Met some great mentors, things like that during my journey. How much would you say mentorship has affected your journey? So when I say mentors, right, I mean, there are two types of mentors. One is like when you're in the lab and you're in the research, there is a mentorship, right? Then at work, there could be mentors, your boss or somebody you are working with. Think about this, Neil. You know, when you're working in the project, they may be more senior than you. They may kind of give you some touch points which you can cling on to. So, I mean, that had helped me. That had helped me boost my confidence and things like that. One of the people I would like to say is Dr. Robert Sikorsky. He's a great, you know, he was the CMO when I was in Five Prime Therapeutics. Great guy. Even now we work in projects together, you know, great clinician. So he has played a role, Dr. Sunil Sharma. He's now with Tijan in Arizona. So these are some names. I'd like to give a shout out to them. Terrific. You mentioned the very grueling nature of this type of work. And how would you say that you managed to balance work and life outside of work as you were pursuing your career aspirations? I, I, again, all the questions are great. You guessed it right. 80% of my time was devoted to professional work. Because especially when you are going up the ladder, right, you take more responsibilities. And now I'm a small business owner, if I may say, right? There is a lot of sacrifices you have to give. And that is one thing. I think this question leads into another point, which is very important. When people think of moving, I get a lot of calls. Even a couple of weeks back, a medical oncologist called me from Mayo Clinic, and they wanted to pursue a career from academia to industry. And they were talking to me and things like that. And this is what I told them. It's not easy. I mean, you know, there has to be some sacrifices you have to do because it's not like you're in an academic setting. Academic setting is busy as it is, but this is much more, much, much more. So I did sacrifice quite a bit, I mean, to develop my professional life. Do you have any tips for ways that you found to actually balance the wellness and care of yourself as you move through those grueling work schedules? Yes. So what I normally do is my work also involves, used to involve a lot of travel. So I go to at least four or five conferences a year, like ASCO, then AACR, ESMO, you know, ASH, then CTOS. And maybe sit is uh, some years. So that is one set of travel, right? Then the second set of travel, 
I go to meet up with the KOLs, uh, big academic centers, you know, the clinicians who are part of our network in the sense who are doing the clinical trial. You know, these are all some of the people I get to work with are very senior, high-profile investigators because they also like to put their name with working with new innovative drugs, right? You get a chance in publishing things. You get to work with these novel therapeutics. So I have to fly to meet them and talk to them where the project is. You know, they are a part of your key advisory team. So I have to always keep them informed and things like that. So what I do is travel is some time where I kind of wind down. So as long as you figure a way out to kind of, for example, I'm traveling coast to coast, you know, I try to sleep in the plane and catch up because at that time I know I I cannot work in the sense, I mean, if there are some slides or something I'm doing, I can, but, you know, I take a quick nap if I can, you know, three, four hours. And then also kind of plan my day and make those time just for myself and, you know, not kind of very focused on work and things like that. So uh, what I would say is try to space it out and see if you can have some time to take it for yourself or, you know, however you, I mean, I do it when I'm traveling. So do you have hobbies that you pursue outside of work? Absolutely. So I used to go to hiking, you know, all those outdoor activities. I like driving. I like hanging out with friends. I have friends all over. So, you know, primarily they are clinicians. I also have friends who are not clinicians, but most of them are obviously. So, you know, I hang out with them, spend time with them or family time. You know, we all get together and things like that. But that's what I do. I mean, because uh, when I get a chance, I kind of, you know, run for a quick run, you know, quick jog and come back. I have hurt my knees recently, so trying to slow down a bit. But otherwise, that's what I do. When you travel, because I'm sure you do have connections all over the world, probably, are you able to incorporate some time out visiting the friends that you have that maybe not related to the specific trip, but friends perhaps from yes. other connections. Yes, for example, when I go to ASCO, I have my cousins there. I mean, my ASCO always happens in Chicago. It, I think it starts end of May all the way first week of June, five, six days. I have my cousin there. I make it a point to visit them every year when I go there. I mean, not the last two years because of COVID, you know, the meetings were virtual. But otherwise, I make it a point to go and visit them, however busy I am. If there's one piece of advice that you could give to someone who is early to mid-career who's considering going into the pharmaceutical industry, a physician or other healthcare provider, what would your advice be? Make sure that's what you want to do because, you know, if you have a family or especially if you are starting a family and things like that, you have to be open to these long hours. Travel also comes. You also have to travel. Because especially you are the clinical development, you know, you have to go to these meetings, is one, and then also, you know, you have to go to academic centers, meet with these clinicians and things like that. So there is a travel involved. So if you have a family raising a small child and things like that, just be cautious. I mean, cautious in the sense, be open to it. That's what I tell people. I mean, I'm not scaring anyone off, but be open to it. You don't think it's very easy to work in the industry. I can tell you it's a very monitored industry. Everything is monitored. Bottom line, you have to be very detailed in whatever you do. You have to be very attentive and detailed. I mean, you cannot mess up. How can people reach you if they're interested in learning more about what you do with your consulting business? Yeah, absolutely. So they can reach out to me, Jen, through my email. Email is always available in the sense I'm connected. So Neil Shankar, N-E-I-L, my last name with the H, so S-H-A-N-K-A-R. My name doesn't have the H, but the email has N-E-I-L-S-H-A-N-K-A-R at gmail.com. So my LinkedIn also is a good way. I mean, I have made my profile public. I have around 31,000 followers. They can reach out to me. But one thing I would also caution them is, I would like the communication to be focused more on a professional side, but absolutely, I mean, if they want to talk about the career path they want to choose, I always will set aside time for that. 
Thank you. This is a really valuable conversation. Dr. Neil Shankar, thank you for joining me today on Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast. Thank you, Jen, for having me. It was great chatting with you. I'm Amanda Taran, producer of Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and head over to DocWorking.com to see all we have to offer.